Brilliant. Good morning, everyone. It's really amazing to be here. It's, it is a privilege. It's said wherever we go, and you might have visitors coming here that say it's a privilege to preach. It really is a privilege to preach. I sent a message to one of our elders this morning. His wife is horribly, horribly, horribly ill, and um, she has been since 2017, and uh, she's been battling cancer and various other things, and he gave a bit of a tough update this morning, and I thought to myself, I, I actually... If I remember correctly, he's leading the meeting back home this morning. That it shouldn't be. He should be with his wife. And I sent him a, a message to say, are you okay? Uh, are you still leading the meeting? And uh, the response back is, it's a privilege. And actually, it is a privilege. I think what the older gentleman shared later, uh, sorry, earlier, it, it really moved me because uh, it centered us back on Jesus and the privilege we have to meet like this um, and to just turn our attention heavenward. For some of us coming in today, I think uh, it is like nourishment in the desert, just to worship again, to experience God again. For, for others, you might be here for a first time, and this is a bit odd or strange, or you're not used to it, it's different to what you've experienced. And can I just encourage you, just hold on, don't let go. Uh, God loves to interact with people. His, his heart is to be near, not, af, not afar. Uh, Emmanuel means God with us. And uh, hold on for the ride and allow God to get into your heart. Allow Him to uh, be experienced by you. Um, I, I am carrying a message for uh, today, and I, I've been thinking, what is it that I want to share? Uh, with the men yesterday, I shared a little bit about my health journey, and I've had a, a very interesting health last 14 years. Uh, I say to people, I'm on my fourth life and uh, delighted about that. When you're on your fourth life, you do some things different. Do you agree with that? So some of your priorities uh, are different to previously. Some of the ambitions are just not there anymore because actually, who cares? I don't need to be X, Y, and Z. I can just be A, B, and C. But uh, one of the things that... Uh, crystallizes for you when you are on your fourth life, as it were, is just what am I about and what is my message and what comes out from within me. And I think that's what I really want to share with us this morning. It's very simple and it's just around the, the topic of faith and faith. Because in essence, uh, what differentiates this group of people today from a group of people that are supporting uh, two soccer teams or that are meeting in a pub or just gathering around something that's uh, it's common to the people that are there. What differentiates us from them? It's, it's actually this thing called faith. It's faith in Jesus, faith in an unseen God, and choosing to believe that. And it's also walking a life of faith with Him. And so we're going to have a look at a, <coughs> excuse me, a scripture and, uh, and mine it a little bit. And I, I trust that more than my words, it just gives you some clarity as to how God's called you to walk on this, on this planet. Hebrews 11 says, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. So what is this church sure of in terms of what they're hoping for? Now, I've heard that some of the things that you're sure of is that God's wanting to extend your boundaries here physically. There's a building project on the way and the leadership team are sure of that. They're hoping for it. Uh, they're certain of what they don't see. But what is their missing link there? It's faith. It's like there's no guarantees, but there's faith to say, God, do it there. Uh, another thing that they're sure of here is what God wants to do in the small groups, the life groups. And you got to a certain point, but actually God wants to do abundantly more. And there's no guarantee that it will happen. And as we say, get involved in life groups and step forward to lead life groups and, and, and. There's no guarantee that it will happen and that momentum will build. But actually there's faith to say, God, we, we feel like we're hearing you and we're going to step out in faith. And the third thing I've heard is that there's a faith to steward faithfully the presence of God in this place. And to be honest, I actually thought after that word around the Lamb of God came, I should not preach. We should keep worshiping. The preachers happened. And the presence of God just came at that moment. Let's be faithful with that. So let me start out by telling you a story. I was in Zimbabwe many years ago. And there was a young man, his name was Brett. And Brett was on mission with us. I love what you said about mission, going. It's what we created for. 
The success of a church is not by the capacity of the church, it's by the sending capacity of the church. And so we're on mission, and we've got about 20 young guys with us, and this one young man, Brett, uh, we're going into a meeting, and I think, I reckon Brett should have a crack at preaching. I asked him, have you ever preached before? He says, never. I said, how's about a 10-minute little sermon uh, to preach? So he said, okay, no, good. He used to call me Wimbo. My surname is Wimble. Wimbo, no problem. So off he went into the bush, and I, I watched him, and I thought, I wonder what he's going to say. And uh, he was out there for about four hours. And uh, eventually, I didn't uh, converse with him further. We just came into the meeting. I, I thought, okay, I hope he's carrying something. He's got 10 minutes. If it's 10 minutes, it's only 10 minutes. We can pick it up. So he comes in, and he starts off, and he says, I was sitting by the roadside today, and I saw a donkey. Now, I don't know whether you've been to Zim, but Zimbabwean donkeys are Zimbabwean donkeys. And uh, he says, you're sitting on the road. Now, it was the main road from Cape to Cairo, that main Zimbabwe road. And he saw this donkey decide that he wanted to get to the other side of the road. And slowly, very slowly, but surely began to walk across the road. And as it walked across the road, he noticed from on the right-hand side, there was this big pantechnicon that was bearing down on the donkey. They were going to have a standoff in essence. And who would win? The amazing end to that story is that the pantechnicon screeched, brakes, and came all the way up to the donkey and stopped on the main highway as the donkey slowly but surely moved its way across the road to the other side. And he started off his message saying, God wants you to have faith like a donkey. <laughs> I've never forgotten that. I want to say to you today, God wants you to have faith like a donkey. Simple faith, certain faith, single-minded faith, even if it's just little by little, it's faith just keep moving. And actually, these intimidating pentecticons of the world can even come to a grinding halt right next to you as you keep your faith aimed toward Jesus Christ. And so Hebrews 11 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so what's actually at play here, you say, yo, it sounds good for, for me. I'm just new in my faith or I'm not quite like this front row or some of the guys out there, etc., etc." No, the essence of what the scripture is saying is that to please God, that's what's at stake. If we operate outside of faith, we're not pleasing God. If I, if I had to describe my relationship with my wife, ultimately the goal of my relationship with my wife is not that we rear kids and feed them and make sure that they, yes, those are all things, but actually it's to please my wife. And in the same way, God's intention for our relationship with Him is that we'd please Him. And how do we do that? It's to walk in faith. He so you can do all the things of the world. You can... Busy yourself, expending yourself for the kingdom, doing all these things. But if it's without faith, it doesn't please God. And so let's read the scripture in, in John the, about Jesus turning water into wine. Verse 1, it says, On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. I think it's John 2. Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. Uh, many men ask their wives that. Woman, why do you involve me <laughs> in this issue? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best till now. And what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory. In other words, this was the beginning of his ministry. And his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with, with his mother and brothers and his disciples. And there they stayed for a few more days. Uh, this is one of the more famous stories in the Bible that uh, even if you're not too knowledgeable on the scriptures, you may have heard this scripture. 
Now, what I want to do is have a look at five things that we draw from this story that faith is. This is what faith is, or this is what faith considers, that I hope will speak to you. Number one, faith, no matter how insignificant. And in verse 1 and 2, it states where the miracle takes place, where Jesus starts his ministry. It's in Cana. Now, what you've got to know about Cana is the insignificance of Cana. I don't know about the low felt, but certainly in KZN, and I've seen in the Cape and other areas, schools and universities are quite important in regulating the pecking order of society. What school did you go to? Ah, you went to that school. Ah, same. Or I went to this school. Or people start off by saying, uh, where did you go to school? And you think to yourself, well, what does it matter actually? I got an education or I qualified there or I did that. Or, and what are we trying to do? It can leave a mark on people if they didn't go to the right school or didn't get the right education. Or you can become overinflated by having gone to that school or that university or having these number of, of degrees. I met someone the other day that was telling me about her third degree that she's on. And I thought to myself, why are you telling me this? I actually just wanted to say hi. That's how they started out. But actually, it's, it's, a, it's a small picture, a cameo of, of how we operate in society. Now, it's significant where Jesus started. He wasn't lured by the credentials of actually I went to this place or that school or this is where I started out my ministry. It would have been so tempting for him to start in Jerusalem and Herod's palace or at the temple or where there were the masses there and say, okay, we've lined up for 30 years. Now it's one, two, three, go. And I've got, it's not dumpy little X, Y, and Z. Can you see how Jesus, he's very strategic where he starts and what does that mean for me? Well, I love the fact that it's insignificant. He, it says of Jesus that he came from Nazareth. And they asked, can anything good come from Nazareth? So Nazareth was where he kind of grew up. And maybe he went to Nazareth public school. And he didn't have a secret handshake with all of his Nazareth public school buddies. It, it just wasn't what you advertised. If you need to know about Nazareth, a notch down from Nazareth is Cana. It was an impoverished little village. This couple that was getting married there, they, they were eking out an existence. And Jesus, I, I'm just, I, I marvel at it because I look at it and I think, when God looks at my life and when He looks at your life, He says, actually, no matter how insignificant you are, no matter what your background is, your credentials, where you come from, it doesn't matter. If faith can arise inside of you, God wants to work. Amen. Amen. So maybe a question to ask is, has the insignificance of your life limited the faith in your heart? I'm just this, or I have just come from that, or I don't know enough, and actually God wants to smash that today. A second point that I draw from the story is faith irrespective of the backstory, which is, sounds quite similar, but it's, it's a little bit different. Irrespective of the backstory. When I think of Jesus as a miracle worker, he, he healed the sick, he cast out demons, he raised the dead, he did a number of miracles, and the majority of those that he healed or interacted with, they, it wasn't as a result of their sin or their errors that they had their affliction. In one case, they ask, why did this happen to this young boy? Was it because of him or because of his parents? And Jesus answers and says, it's neither. It was actually so that I might be glorified. And so that's very much a mark of how Jesus worked with, with the people back then. But what's so interesting about this first miracle is that it was absolutely as a result of an administrative error. That Jesus is lured in and has to save the day. Now, for some of you administrators out there, you, you, we get a tweak when we think wedding and things going wrong, right? Or women's conference yesterday and everything's got to be in order. Men's, men's conference, not so much. Just yeah. some breakfast buns and get the speaker up and out. <laughs> and we're happy. But ladies, it's longer, there's lots more decor, it's, that's how it goes. You can imagine a wedding for, for the poor couple that had done 
their little bit of planning and put their miserly little life savings toward their wedding. And suddenly it, it comes to naught as they run out. I've seen some errors at weddings. I've seen uh, people forget the rings. I've done, I think, about 200 weddings in my life. And you see a bit. I've seen uh, the bride arrive fashionably late where it's not actually fashionable. People are beginning to get a bit irritated, actually. I've seen uh, one of our friends drop the rings and it landed up under the piano. And he had to, as the minister, he had to get a coat hanger to draw it out again. Many different things. I, I, I think the worst that I've seen was actually uh, a wedding where they forgot the music and it was in the days of the CD and the bride wanted that CD with that song and it was between Kloof and Maritzburg or Kloof, so we say, and Maritzburg and about a 40 minute drive and she was absolutely adamant we have to go get that music and all of the guests were seated under the sun, there was no shade. By the time it ended, I mean, the thing about that wedding is that I've done 200 weddings, but that's the one I remember. So the thing that I, I, I love about the faith in this story is that it's irrespective of the backstory, the administrative error. Actually, faith can grow in our hearts, and that's God's intention. I think the application for us is that there are many people that have regrets, and they would say this, if I had another chance, if I had my life over, I would do things so different. And there's validity to that. But sometimes we limit God because of those things. So some may be in their twilight years and say, if I had to do it all over again, all of these things I'd change. And as a result of that, you just plug actually what God wants to do with your final years. Maybe you've got two or three more years, but... Imagine what God can do in those two or three years. Look what He did with three years. And that's faith. No matter the back story. I was so overwhelmed this last Sunday. There there was an ex-national cricketer that lives in Durban. And his life fell apart. And he got divorced. And he's estranged from his family and his kids. And it's just gone from bad to worse to worse to even worse. And... He was on a knife edge with the school and the headmaster came and said to me, you know, is there any way that you can help? And he started coming to church and it's interesting to see how he was trying to put his life together. About six weeks ago, I got a message from this man to say, I'd love to get baptized. And I was away that week. I was preaching in another another town and We got the photos of this man getting baptized, and it was just such a wonderful moment that we were celebrating, because in his story, there had been so much error and so much mess, and yet he was able to see Jesus. And faith just rose in his heart to say, I I can't see how the mess is going to get fixed, but I'm going to take my little step, and faith rose in his heart. This last Sunday, as I walked into church, and music had started, I wasn't preaching or leading the meeting, and I, I was just at the back for a moment, and I looked to my left-hand side, and there he was, lost in worship with hands raised just for two songs, just admiring the King, worshiping the King. Uh, friends, that's faith amidst the backstory. The third point that I want to share is that faith looks at Mary, who was a pillar of trust. We've got her in the story, admire uh, her faith in Jesus. You say, it might say, oh, it was her son. She'd possibly seen glimpses of the God-man along the way. But remember, he hadn't displayed his glory. He had held everything at arm's length. She was admiring his wisdom from a young age, but not his power. And yet in this moment, uh, she says these amazing words. She says, do whatever he tells you. What is that summed up as? It's summed up as obedience. Actually, sometimes what we need to hear in the church environment, we don't need more counseling. We don't need more one-on-ones and coffee. We need to ask this question, what did he tell you? What was the last thing Jesus spoke to you? I don't know. Well, let's try and help mine that thing because Jesus speaks to his people. The Father speaks to his children. And actually, obedience is all about this currency of 
of trust. And Mary seemed to understand something. I love these things about Mary. And, and some of us, we control freaks out there. I, I'm sometimes like that. We, we want to control the environment. And I, I'm a problem solver. I, like, I don't like problems. Who likes problems? But when problems come, I like to solve them. And here was a, a giant problem. She doesn't know what he's going to do. She doesn't present Jesus with the solution. We sometimes do that, hey? Husbands to wives or wives to husbands. Uh, can you solve the problem, but can you do it this way? Uh, she doesn't know whether he's going to smooth things over or who, who he's going to call. Uh, if he's going to ask one of his friends, she has no idea how it's going to happen. And she makes no attempt to control the process. That's very challenging for me in my walk with Christ. I remember when we were making a big decision around our kids' schooling, actually. And it was, it was quite a giant decision because there were multiple scenarios and, and um, routes to our end goal. And it came down to a particular weekend. It was actually the Easter weekend, if I remember, or just before the Easter weekend. And we were doing a wedding of a couple. We were staying in the Midlands. And on the way up there, we had this amazing phone call. And we, we had to get back to them within four days. And we enjoyed the wedding, but our, our minds were alert with, actually, God, what are you saying? about our future and our children's future, and we wrestled and we prayed, and it came down to D-Day on the Monday, and we wrote down all the things that we felt God say, and we spoke to a few people, which I think is also important to speak to wise people along the way, and I'll never forget, uh, with an hour to go, I phoned one of my friends, and I outlined the process. I said, this is what's happened, this is how we've been processing it, and what we felt God say to us. And I just wanted to get your thoughts on it. And he said these very amazing words. He says, it sounds good what, how you guys have been processing. I really believe God will speak to you. Like, I don't want to hear that. I would like you to lead me in a direction. Are we hearing right? Are we not hearing right? Help us along the way. And it was so profound what he said because he sincerely believes that actually God talks to his children. And really, it was do whatever he tells you. And it gave us courage and confidence to say, actually, we're going to take our step here. And the amazing other side of that step has not been education. It's not been sport. It's not been the success of the kids. It's actually been the fruitfulness of ministry into an environment. Do whatever he tells you. That's the safest place to live. Can I say this about the road of faith and trust? Mary was a pillar of trust. Is that no one can walk your road of faith for you. That is tragic news for some of us. If only someone can walk that road for me. <clears throat> Often we hear of children that speak about their parents and how they, they were coming to church or following Jesus because of their parents and they had a parent faith or a social faith because of my friends. But at a certain point we're confronted with this reality of what about your faith? What about my faith? And, and this is what the truth of the matter is in the kingdom is that God is a father. He's not a grandfather. And he interacts with children, fathers with children. And, you know, it, it would be so easy to say, I interact with God via this person or via that person, but that's not how God designed it. And so what's the application today <coughs> for us again? Are you willing, like Mary, to throw yourself on Jesus without prerequisites and parameters? And secondly, are you willing to stir your faith and the faith of others in a mighty God that wants to shine through? And third question, are you willing to trust them with that which is not guaranteed? I, I love as we've been prodding and poking and walking with the leaders here to, to just see that the leaders here are as best as possible. They, they're trying to walk in faith. It's a safe place to be, friends. Uh, it's not guaranteed and there might be the odd mistake here and there and we're going to change one or two things, as we may have misheard, etc., but rather be venturing out onto the water and into the realm of faith than just sitting casual saying, let it just happen. Amen. Number four, faith looks at what's inside. Faith looks at what's inside. So when you look at the miracle of changing water into wine, how did Jesus actually do this? Because I guess with unlimited power, being God from heaven, he could have done anything. And what he says is, go and get the ceremonial jars. Now, those ceremonial jars were very interesting because they were 
like ritualistic part of the existence of the average person there. And so when, when they were dragged in, they, they could have been or would have been uh, full of dirty water as the people cleansed themselves, or they were empty, but the people knew what they had been used for. Now, how many times when we look at things that God wants to use, we look at them and immediately we just dispel them? Because that just doesn't fit with my ideology or with who I am or where I've come from. It's not, culturally, it's not comfortable for me that. And so I dispel it or I judge it or I move away from it or I say it can't be God. And I move back to what's the realm of comfort. That, that, that's far more preferable. So Jesus takes these ceremonial jars and it's quite interesting that he fills them or he gets them to fill, be filled with, uh, with water. The equivalent, amazing, the equivalent of 600 bottles of high quality wine comes out of these ceremonial jars without breaking a sweat. Isn't that a display of power? It's remarkable that. And I mean, if you look at it from a cost point of view, 100 rand a bottle of wine, that's 60,000 rand. 500 bottle, rand a bottle of wine, I mean, they say it's high quality. That's 300,000 rands worth of wine where previously there's been zero. Just in a moment. I, 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 I love it. And it's this extraordinary display of power that's on the inside. Actually, it's not so much about the ceremonial jar. It's not so much about the outer appearance, the outer man, all these external things, what God's looking at in your life and in my life is that what's on the inside. There's a little kid that was watching cricket with us a number of weeks ago, two years old, and water had run out in Durban, and this kid fell in the mud and then couldn't really speak very well, but came back to his mom and was looking for something to wipe himself. And she gave him some wet wipes, and the dad sitting next to me, they're in our church, and he said, you know we've run out of water. So I said, I didn't know that. He says, what I'm saying is that tomorrow, as dirty as this kid is now, he might be equally dirty tomorrow at church. <laughs> and I chuckled. And, he, and then he said, but it's not what's on the outside, it's what's on the inside that counts. He just threw it like that, and I thought, it's, that's actually what Jesus would say. That's what Jesus would say. And so you might be a ceremonial jar today. You might be less than. You may have less capacity. You might be just a container. And that doesn't matter. It's what God does on the inside that ultimately matters. And the fifth and final point that I want to make before I just uh, close is that faith fills it to the brim. Faith fills it to the brim. One of the aspects of serving Jesus is this filling it to the brim. When my boys fill the pool, uh, I came back the one day and they'd filled it to the broom. Now in this economy of water scarcity, that wasn't clever for the neighbors walking past and for the dad who has to pay for the water. Then they turn off the water and it's a hot day and then they go and dive back into the pool and all the water jumps out again. And, and I mean, it's not very, the youthful zeal keeps going in that kind of way maturity that's cynical says no 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 just over one tile and just keep it there and actually what that's why jesus says i want you to become like little child children youthful zeal is actually a preferable way to work out your faith and when the mess happens all around and there's cost attached to it and expense and 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 that's where jesus says let me take care of that part but you work out in faith this is a a, a saying that i a little quote that came apart upon that I think is really true. It says, sometimes we have to do the ridiculous before God will do the miraculous. I find that very challenging. I've had one or two moments in my life where that ridiculous has confronted me and I've thought, Lord, I, I, it's sink or swim. If this doesn't come off, actually it's, it's more than egg on the face. Uh, as I shared yesterday about my, my health story, uh, 2017, I was diagnosed with cancer. I had a major brain op, and then uh, about six weeks later, uh, they did a PET scan, which they discovered I had a bunch of tumors all over my body. And the doctor said to me, listen, there's not too many treatment options. There's this one, um, but there's lots of side effects. It's very expensive. We didn't have the, the money. And then 
And they said, we, the only other option is to get onto a clinical trial. And didn't know much about clinical trials. You're basically a guinea pig to new medication. They're hopeful, but be that as it may. And most of the trials were in Durban, Cape Town, Joburg, Pretoria. So I was knocking on doors saying, you know, is there anything going? And I said, no, nothing. So I went to see the doctor again. He said, listen, we really need to make a decision here. What are we going to do? Because he was very concerned about the cancer. It was fast growing. And so I said to him, okay, give me some time. And now he phoned me, actually. So give me some time. And I went in prayer to the Lord. And I was looking out the window at the ocean. And my family were out. And I, I was actually in a corner. I mean, how do you make decisions about your own life when you've got no finances, you actually don't know anything about the medication or the cancer, and the doctor's saying, can you make a decision? And as I was looking out over the ocean, I realized it was the 1st of September. And on the 1st of September, it was the day that myself and Justine started dating. It was, uh, it was one of our key moments in our life. It's the first day of spring. It was the first day that we moved to Durban. It was just one of our sentimental Days And I'm praying on the 1st of September saying, God, show me my future. We dated for 40 days, then we got engaged. We'd known each other for many years, so don't try it, but uh, we did that. And, uh, and so the 1st of September, and as I'm praying, I just have in my spirit, I just have the sense of wait for 40 days. And I'm like, geez, what I know is so limited. And to have the courage to go back to the doctor and say to him, I'm going to wait for 40 days, he's going to question me, why 40 days? So anyway, I phone him and I say to him, uh, this is my answer. I think that we should wait for 40 days. He says, why 40 days? I said, you're just not going to understand, but can we just wait for 40 days? And so I said, okay, that's fine. What is the date? It happened to be, I think, the 11th of October. And over those 40 days, you can imagine the clock is ticking. And you're thinking, well, how do we live? I felt God say to me, live your life to the full. And you know, I said before you, life and death, choose life. And so I, I chose to live. Uh, I've just come out of a brain op. I've got cancer all over me. I chose to live. Uh, but got to day 25, day 26, and uh, Grant, who some of you will know, he said to me, why don't you go paddle this Fish River canoe marathon? Now, again, that is just not responsible to do when you've just had a brain op. But I know the, the river a little, and I know the marathon. is not too much running, and there's, it's fast-flowing water, so you can just kind of putt your way to the end. I thought, I'm going to do this thing. And so we driving down to Craddock, and while we're going, Grant says to me, you know that, that, sorry, as we're driving back, it's day 37, I think. He says, you know that particular lady, and I did know this lady, I'd actually house sat to a house 25 years before in Peter Marisburg. He says, you know this lady's got the same cancer you've got? I said, I didn't know this. He says, you know she's just got onto the same trial you're trying to get onto? So I said, that's amazing. But so many people give you so many different bits of advice that you eventually just put them in your pocket and you just, you find your way. And as I got home, it's day 38, I decided actually nothing ventured, nothing gained. Let me just contact this lady. I found her number somehow. She lives in Cape Town now. I sent her a message and I said, uh, don't know whether you remember me, but this is what I'm about. I'm actually trying to inquire about this clinical trial. She says, you wouldn't believe it. I'm actually going in to see the doctor tomorrow, day 39, I think it was. I'll ask her. She gets hold of me on day 39. She sends me a message. She says, you won't believe it. The trial has opened. I'm like, geez, that's amazing. But get your doctor to speak to my doctor. So I just forward the message on. I put my own spin on it. And then a day later, on day 40, I'm going to meet the doctor. So we get into the doctor. I've just had scans now. And he says, I've got bad news for you. So I said, what is it? He said, the cancer's more than doubled in your, in your body. It's not good news. My wife's crying next to me. It's a pretty dire situation. But I've got this hope in my heart. And I'd like to say it was because it was attached to faith for me. I'm not prescribing how you do it. I'm describing what happened to me. It's day 40 and the doors closed. I said, okay, but what, what about that message I sent you? He said, I've tried for 24 hours and the doors closed. She, she's not answering. There's no reply. So I said, well, is there any chance you can phone again now while we're here? My wife's crying and I'm hopeful. It just didn't make sense. And so he, he dials the number and she picks up the phone and I hear them conversing and she says, how soon can he go down? He says, how soon can he go? He says, I'll leave. 
I say, I'll leave right now. Day 40, friends, the trial opened up. I got onto this trial, and within three months, the cancer was out of my body. Absolutely incredible. I, what, what am I saying to us? That's like a stake in the ground for me, for my life, among many other things to say that actually this thing of faith that pleases God. And actually when we walk out in faith, that was my journey. I was praying, I was trusting, I had to live life, and it was dire straits at the 13th hour, but actually faith took me over the line. What about you today? Maybe we can stand. I'm going to ask the band to come forward. One of the things about the distinctives about Cana, this little village, is that it was from the tribe of Asher. And when Jacob on his deathbed was prophesying over his sons, he said this about Asher, or over Asher, he said, from you, you'll provide delicacies fit for a king. And so it's no surprise that Jesus starts out in Cana at a poor couple's little wedding. I look at us today, I look at society and I think, you know what, if only men and women would follow the example of this poor little couple, you know the most amazing thing that they did, is they invited Jesus to the wedding. And Jesus works with invitation. He doesn't bash his way in. He gives us opportunity at various points of our life to invite him in. He knocks on the door. And actually many of us resist. But for some of us here today, it might be one or two. Maybe that's what you needed to hear today. I identify with that poor little couple. Things have gone awry. Would you invite Jesus into your wedding, your mess, your life, and start out today? I'm going to give you an opportunity in a moment to respond to that. For, for some of us today, this little phrase, Obey with zeal. God's calling you to obey with zeal. And fill it to the brim. Obey with zeal what God's calling you to do. For others, it's trusting God again. Say, yeah, I've heard what you've said. Actually, faith has waned in my life. I'm walking in presumption. And I, I, I long to walk in that economy of faith again. Remember, it's not large faith. It's little faith in a large God. It's mustard seed faith. So I'm going to pray for us now and I'm going to encourage us and invite us to respond. If you, maybe we can bow our heads, close our eyes and just have a moment with, with your maker. You might be even resting that thing through. But while our heads are bowed, if you're here this morning and you, you've never made you've never made a commitment to Jesus or you've never crossed the line of faith to invite Him to be your Lord and Savior and you identify with that couple and say, I need to invite Jesus to my wedding. I need to invite Jesus into my life. If that's you today, just while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, you just want to wave at me. Just say, Mark, that's me. I'm not going to call you up. But I just want to know who I'm praying for if there's anyone like that. Just one, two, three people. I'd love to just give this opportunity wherever I go in the event of there being one or two people. It's a great day when people cross that line of faith. Okay, then for the rest of us, if you're here today and you know that God's calling you to walk this daring journey of faith, maybe it's waned, maybe God's calling you to obey in a new way, maybe He's touched some things in your heart today, I'm going to ask you just to raise your hands. Just in surrender to, to Christ. Just raise your hands to Him as a response to Him. And we're going to pray together. We're going to pray. Maybe as I'm praying, you just do business with God. Say, God, I want to walk in faith. In that area, my marriage and relationships with people, my business, wherever it may be, I want to walk in faith. Father, I pray for 
this crew, this congregation, this community. Thank you for what you're doing here, Lord. Thank you for John Cheryl and for this team, Lord, that are leading toward you. Thank you for what you want to do in them. But Lord, thank you for individuals here. Lord, you know their story. You know what they're wrestling with. You know what they confronted with. But we go back to that story in the beginning of that Pentecostal that's bearing down. Father, I pray that today, Lord, faith would be dispensed into our heart, Lord. Small faith, but effective faith that would allow us to get going across the road, like that donkey, and get moving. Step by step, little by little, in your direction, oh God. Thank you that there's more. Thank you that there's another side that you're calling us to and beyond. And I pray, Lord, as men and women in this place begin to respond to you, thank you that you pour your spirit out upon them. You come upon them, Lord. Let faith arise, oh God.